it's my privilege to introduce our luncheon speaker today, Judge David Arnott. David has had a long and distinguished career. Originally, as a Crown Prosecutor in Saskatchewan and a Senior Crown Prosecutor. He was appointed Judge of the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan in 1981, which is when I had the privilege of first meeting David. And he was a Provincial Court Judge and I was um, still in high school, actually. <laughs> and then in September of 1994, David was seconded to the Federal Department of Justice as Director General of Aboriginal Justice. In May 96, promoted to the position of Special Advisor to the Deputy Minister of Justice for Canada. And then on January 1st, 1997, he was made Treaty Commissioner for Saskatchewan for a 10-year period. And when I was uh, in the government of Saskatchewan and then at the Saskatchewan <coughs> Institute of Public Policy, I had the chance to work with David again and was very uh, pleased and privileged to be able to assist him on projects. Uh, Judge Arnott's work on teaching treaties in the classroom was specifically cited as a model for Canada by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Racism in his report presented in March 2004. And in October 2005, the Office of the Treaty Commission was selected by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation to receive its biennial award of excellence for education programs in the public and governmental sector. Judge Arnott introduced the phrase, a phrase that has become an important touchstone in Saskatchewan and is becoming such across the country. We are all treaty people, which captures the nature of the treaty relationship in Canada. He's produced a number of video education projects, been involved in education for the judiciary through the National Judicial Institute, the Western Judicial Education Center, the Canadian Association of Provincial Court Judges, and the American Judges Association. And he was honored by the Canadian Bar Association's Saskatchewan branch as a recipient of its Distinguished Service Award for 2007. Judge Arnett was seconded from the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan into his current position as Chief Commissioner of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission on January 15, 2009, for a five-year term. And then on January 15, 2014, he was reappointed as Chief Commissioner for an additional five-year term. So please join me in welcoming our luncheon speaker, Judge David Arnett. Thank you very much, uh, Ian, for that uh, kind introduction. I really appreciate that. I'm very honored to be here, and I want to first uh, thank the elders uh, for their prayers of welcome uh, this morning and uh, yesterday as well. And I want to acknowledge uh, the peace and friendship uh, treaties in this territory and, and note that uh, it's unceded First Nations land, uh, as has been mentioned a number of times this morning. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Folks, I'm here to, today to, I should also mention, by the way, I'm part of the Saskatchewan Mafia. And I see a few of the members here today. Marilyn Poitra, Elias, there's somebody I don't know from Saskatchewan, how are you doing? <laughs> oh wow, we're, we're all over the place, thanks very much, right. Who loves the riders? All oh, right. <laughs> Uh, Noel, Noel Lyon and Marie, and, uh, and of course Ian, who I, I work for. I forgot that in uh, 1981 I met uh, uh, Ian as he was living in North Battleford at the time, a very intelligent young man in the high school there at the time, and, uh, and I forgot about that. So anyway, I'm here today to tell you about an intersection between Aborig Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, and human rights. And, is it, and as much as my presentation is about those rights, uh, it's fundamentally about relationships, treaty relationships. The issues between governments and Indigenous people and between Indigenous people and other Canadians is indeed in serious need of repair. The relationship is broken. It first uh, became clear to me in uh, 1992. I was sitting as a provincial court judge in Saskatchewan 
in a small community of 20,000 people, and uh, it was surrounded by 10 First Nations in about a 50 kilometer proximity. And you know, if you sit in uh, Saskatchewan, if you sit in the courts, many places in Canada, it's the same experience. When the doors of the courthouse opened every morning, a sea of Aboriginal people came in the door. And after a while, it got to the point where, you know, I realized something had to be done. The system wasn't working. It was fundamentally broken. And, uh, and I needed to do something about it. And I, I reached out to some people at what was called the Western Judicial Education Center. Uh, because I needed to, uh, you know, make a contact with the First Nations people. And one of the things was I knew I couldn't sort of go out to Poundmaker First Nation and say, hey, I'm the judge, take me to your elders. You know, that wasn't going to work. So my first experience was to go to a sweat lodge that was organized in Hobima, Alberta, by an elder, Winston Okamau, and uh, it was quite an experience for me. It was the first time I was in a sweat lodge. I asked the elder, uh, can you put me in contact with somebody from my area because I do want to make an outreach to the community because I know that we need to do some changes in the way uh, the justice system is working. And he gave me a name and a telephone number. And I returned to Saskatchewan and I kind of sat on it for a week, you know, to work up enough courage to, to give a call. And uh, I, I did call and the person answered the phone. And I said, you know, I'm the judge and uh, I'd like to meet with you, and, and he says, yeah, I know. Uh, I've been waiting for your call for about 150 years. <laughs> and he meant it. And uh, from that, I had the full immersion program in treaties, the treaty relationship, thanks to the elders from Poundmaker, Saskatchewan. So it was very clear to me early that the relationship between Aboriginal people and other Canadians is broken, it's systemic, and there's a lot of work to do, and I know it's clear to everybody in this room. Uh, there have been improvements uh, made over time, and I believe there's a, a real evolution is occurring. And in part, it's through the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and human rights agencies in Canada, and internationally by the United Nations, uh, through and in particular, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And I'm going to speak about that because I think it's quite important, because there's a nexus between these agencies, their activities, and action that can take place in Canada. <clears throat> this also helps us understand the nexus between Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, and human rights. So over the course of uh, my career, I viewed the negative outcomes of social stigma, and in particular, the marginalization of Aboriginal people in this Canada, in this country, from a justice perspective, a crime perspective, and a law and order perspective. Most of the statistics that we were using, say, 20 years ago, were all about break and enter, theft, assault, and violence though not about the violence being experienced by Indigenous women, as we know it today, who are disproportionately murdered or quote, quote, missing in this country. You know, over the course of my experience uh, as a treaty commissioner, I dealt with complicated, very, very detailed issues. In fact, uh, my hair was jet black before I came became treaty commissioner. I got one white hair for every tough issue at the treaty table. <clears throat> but there was a simple question that I was asked, even though I was dealing with complex issues, and the simple question was this, is there hope? Is there hope for the First Nations to enter into a better relationship, a better partnership in Canada? Is there hope for the First Nations to share in the peace, prosperity, and the harmony that's the very essence of this country? And I say today, there is hope. And that hope is based on a number of factors. One is a change in the federal government recently, where there's a lot of expectation, a lot of promises have been made, and an opportunity to do things in a much different way. A new approach, and a recognition that there is a failed relationship in Canada, and we have to move forward. And that coincides with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission's reports. There's two prime, uh, preliminary and a final one coming soon the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And what I say is the role of human rights commissions in Canada in every jurisdiction to play a role in the reconciliation uh, that's required in this country. And the hope fundamentally lies in this, in implementing the treaty relationship throughout Canada according to the spirit and intent of those treaties. 
In January 2009, I was appointed, uh, as Rick, uh, Ian mentioned, uh, as Chief Commissioner of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission. And in this role, I see the negative effect of marginalization and discrimination against all peoples uh, in our province. I believe by exploring the relationship between Aboriginal treaty and human rights, we will be able to pursue some of the solutions that we so desperately need. First, I want to talk a little bit about Aboriginal and treaty rights. These are rights that were discussed at the uh, tripartite negotiations that I was involved in between 1997 and 2007 in Saskatchewan in a process known as the Saskatchewan Exploratory Treaty Table. At that time in 1997, it was the first time that the Government of Canada, the Government of Saskatchewan, and the First Nations actually sat down together and discussed in a meaningful way what the treaties were all about as odd as that seems, because the treaties by that time were over 100 years old. <clears throat> While there was a willingness to talk, I want to be clear that immediate consensus wasn't forthcoming. Frankly, the parties were a million miles apart in their positions. And so what I said to the parties was this. If you stick to those positions, we're going to get nowhere. What I really want you to think about is what are your interests, Canada, Saskatchewan, and the First Nations, the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, where do you want to be 50 years from now, 40, 30, 20, 10, 5? Think about that. Think about how we're going to get there. And the parties did that. To bridge this gulf in understanding, we commissioned a very important work, uh, done by the late Harold Cardinal and Walter Hildebrand. And it's the oral history of, from the treaty elders in the province of Saskatchewan. The treaty elders of Saskatchewan book. That contains the principles of treaty making from the First Nations perspective. It also contains the Cree creation story, which I was told is the first time it was ever shared with the non-Aboriginal world. And these principles of treaty making have a universality to them. They include uh, Miwa Chidawin, having good relations with everyone, with Taskiwin, which is living on the land together, and appreciating the land, revering the land, Pamachuan, the right of everyone to earn a living, which was a cultural imperative with the Aboriginal people, and Tapwewin, the duty to speak the truth. These are principles that are really compelling, and this book is a, a must read for everybody, and it has, I think, uh, tr um, trans <clears throat> it can be translated uh, to all jurisdictions because those principles are universal. The second component of the research was a book, this one, Bounty and Benevolence, done by Jim Miller at the University of Saskatchewan, Arthur Ray and Frank Tuff. And we asked those authors to look at the treaties. This is the first time the treaties were told from a historic point of view, specifically to Saskatchewan. Look at the right of self-governments, build a forward-looking relationship, discuss the honor of the crown. What that book pointed out was that the First Nations people expected a relationship that they had known about would continue. And the relationship primarily was with the Hudson's Bay Company. And I, I, it can be argued that that was a, a relationship of mutual benefit and mutual respect. And that was the expectation. It didn't turn out that way for obvious reasons. Using those pieces of research, then Saskatchewan, the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations and the Government of Canada came together to produce a statement of common interest, and that's the statement of treaty issues. And the statement of treaty issues uh, outlines seven top priorities, and they were education, child welfare, health, shelter, treaty annuities, justice, hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering, and lands and resources. And in order to do that, they had to work collaboratively. And uh, they came to 16 common understandings. That's the Government of Canada, the Federation of Saskatchewan, the Indian Nations, the Government of Saskatchewan. 16 common understandings that underlie the treaty relationship. Very important, and, and again, it has applicability everywhere in Canada, in my opinion. They were the guiding principles that would govern interactions. And those common understandings, in fact, were used to inform the creation of the Kelowna Accord in 2005. The purpose of the treaty table in Saskatchewan was to try to define the meaning of the treaties in a contemporary context. And out of those 16, I'll just touch on six major agreements. This is where Canada and the FSIN agreed that treaty making created the fundamental political relationship and treaties represent a common intersection, politically and historically. 
There is a solemnity to treaties. They're about mutual respect and mutual benefit. The honour of the Crown and the honour of the First Nations is at stake in every relationship. And a healthy relationship requires the ongoing good uh, intentions behind the honour of the Crown and the honour of the First Nations. And fundamentally, resolve, differences could be resolved by mutual discussion and deci decision making. In other words, not a resort to litigation. <coughs> Avoid litigation. The provincial government is required, this was an agreement required for progress to be made for real in, uh, implementation of the treaty relationship. And I think that's a fundamental principle that applies everywhere in Canada because the provincial government can't hide behind the big federal government anymore. You know, it, well, all parties have to sit down to make this reconciliation work and to see that the treaties are implemented properly. One of the, the sixth principle is that the principles of the treaty relationship are fundamentally to benefit all people, in my case, the, the province of Saskatchewan, but all people in Canada. And of course, Chief Justice Lemaire and Dalgamook said, no one's going away, and what we really need is an interest-based political forum to deal with these issues through a negotiation. That needs to be remandated. Um, in 2006, of course, there was a change in government, and a lot of the work that was done in Saskatchewan at the exploratory table, uh, treaty table, was that in fact put on hold for the last nine years. But it can be revisited because that good work can still inform good relations here today and in the future. What I came to realize was that cooperation and respect are difficult to achieve. Uh, if there uh, <clears throat> isn't even a basic understanding about what principles are, what the uh, issues are, and what the history is. And more to the point, education is the only means to achieve an understanding. Education is critically important. You know, uh, Bob Ray said last night that it, uh, corporations and leaders that he speak to have no idea about the history of the treaties in this country. You know, in 1999, we did an Angus Reid uh, study in Saskatchewan, <clears throat> and we asked people in Saskatchewan, adult, the adult cohort, the non-adult, or the non-Aboriginal adult cohort, what do you know about treaties? 78% of those people said, well, you know, we really don't know too much about treaties, which I've got a, an issue with. But 68% of the people said, you know, we think if we knew more about treaties, and the treaty relationship, the relationship between ourselves and the First Nations people would improve. And that was a heartening statistic. Now, from my own sort of anecdotal interaction with the people in Saskatchewan, it was more like 99% of the people didn't know anything about treaties. But I also noticed about 100% of the people had, a, had an opinion and they were free to voice it, whether it was informed or not. So that non-understanding in the larger non-Aboriginal uh, cohort creates a paralysis with policy makers. <clears throat> From my own experience, I can say this, you know, when, when I went to school in Saskatchewan, I didn't learn anything about the treaties, the First Nations treaties. I learned about the treaties from Europe, you know, the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Utrecht, the treaties that ended wars in Europe, but not the basic building blocks of our country, which the government of Canada acknowledged in response to the RCAP report that these treaties are the basic building blocks of our country. When my great grandparents came into Saskatchewan, it was the Northwest Territories at the time, to homestead, they were exercising a treaty right. Their right to come onto that land came from Treaty Number Four. Did they know that? Absolutely not. Did anybody tell them? Absolutely not. Did we study that in school? Not a chance. Treaties were never taught in school. They need to be taught in school. They need to be taught in every school in Canada. You know, in Saskatchewan at the Human Rights Commission, <clears throat> we've taken the view that if you want to change the culture in the community, you have to change the culture in the school first. You've got to work with that great K to 12 group, and it can be done. <coughs> Racism is woven into the fabric of uh, the province of Saskatchewan. That can be denied. And I like to think that the Teaching Treaties in the Classroom project, which is a great K-12 uh, project, uh, has helped to reduce that uh, element of racism with that younger cohort. K-12 uh, uh, materials are involved in uh, education in Saskatchewan, and they te talk about treaties and the treaty relationships significantly. I see that work as fundamentally 
an anti-racism education kit for the most part. But, you know, we, could, we didn't uh, craft it that way. We crafted it so that all students in Saskatchewan could understand it. We can see changes. Changes, you know, are moving very, very quickly. I was sharing with Dave the, the other day <clears throat> this idea that recently at the public school division in Saskatoon, which is the largest school division in Saskatchewan, one of the people that works at my office went to a parents' night. And uh, it was at one of the local schools. And before uh, it started, there was acknowledgement that they were in the heart of Treaty 6 territory. There was a smudge ceremony and an honor song. So those are starting to work their way into the culture of Saskatchewan, and it's moving, moving very well. And as Ian mentioned, the two, in 2004, the Special Rapporteur on Racism uh, came to Canada, saw that, and said, that's a model for all of Canada, and I believe that's the, the case. And I know that the Manitoba, Jamie Wilson's uh, commission is doing great work on exactly that issue. In 2008, the government of Saskatchewan, which is uh, uh, the Saskatchewan party, uh, uh, conservative uh, party, made teaching treaties in the uh, classroom mandatory in every grade and every school in Saskatchewan. And we're now starting to see the effects of that. So <clears throat> that history then talks about the basic details of our shared history, including some of the actions that don't reflect very well in our country. Uh, I, when I was Treaty Commissioner, I had to really start from scratch because such a sea of non-understanding about treaties. And we had to explain ideas like the treaties, the Royal Proclamation, and the Indian Act, and how it affected people. And I would say that treaties fundamentally were a contract. That's the idea I was trying to get across. Of course, from the First Nations point of view, they were basically a covenant. That what we would consider, a non-Aboriginal person would consider an Old Testament covenant. And that was explained to us by a number of the elders because they said that the treaties were made between three parties, the Crown, the First Nations, and the Creator. It surprised people that the treaties, historic though they might be, outlined what the Government of Canada agreed to do with the First Nations people in exchange for access to the land, the province of Saskatchewan. What many people didn't understand, and people still don't understand, is that tr treaties are designed to benefit everyone in the province, and especially the, including the First Nations people. Uh, we're all treaty people. That's a phrase that came to us from one of the treaty elders, the late Elma Kaitwahat, and uh, we were able to uh, amplify that, and, and it's heartening to see these words being uh, used in other places. It's starting to enter into the lexicon in Canada, and uh, it's very important because that phrase really captures you know, the fundamentals of that treaty relationship, that we are all treaty people and there's rights and obligations on both sides. And the non-Aboriginal people have to come up to the mark when it comes to their responsibilities in the treaty relationship. I'm going to digress here for just a second. I'm going to talk about why treaties were made. And I know in this room, most people know the answers to these questions. But um, I'm just going to touch on it very quickly then and just say that in 1763, uh, after the Peace and uh, Friendship Treaties here, when King George III granted the Royal Proclamation, he established the guidelines for peaceful expansion of territory in British North America. He was also altering the history of Canada because that actually uh, uh, comes into the uh, British constitutional law. And it was that model that was followed in Sir John E. Macdonald's national policy when they started to do the number of treaties that uh, are in Western Canada. With respect to the treaty relationship, Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, and human rights, the proclamation is viewed as uh, a Magna Carta from the perspective of the First Nations people because it talks about Aboriginal rights, and there's two important points. One, it protected First Nations land, and two, it recognized Aboriginal peoples as nations. I'm going to talk a little bit more just a little bit later about the UN Declaration on the rights of Indigenous people, but I argue that those two uh, matters and that declaration is sufficiently broad and accommodating to be of real assistance to the Indigenous people of Canada, and for that matter, all Canadians, because it refers to those two principal points in that Royal Proclamation. But I want to touch uh, on one of the more darker elements of Canadian history, and I'd say this, the fundamental problem in Canada is that the treaty relationship did not find its rightful place in the Canadian state. 
but rather the good intentions of the original treaty parties and I think uh, were replaced by the paternalistic policies inherent in the Indian Act regime. An assimilation policy that failed the First Nations and failed Canadians. It was very clear in the Treaty 4 negotiations in Fort Capel in 1874 that the First Nations were negotiating for integration, economic integration into the, uh, with the newcomers. They weren't negotiating assimilation. That's what they got. Some people don't know that Duncan Campbell Scott in 1929 was the equivalent of the Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs and he said to parliamentarians in 1929, don't worry, we're not going to have an Indian problem in 50 years. How is that? We're not going to have any Indians. How are you going to do that? The assimilation policy. That was his answer. It's actually shocking. And most pe people would be shocked to know that, but that's exactly what happened. Others will know that by a set of social indices, Canada is measured uh, as a G7 country every year on a set of social indices that really brings us to, you know, number six or five, and we're really high in that set, set of social indices as the best place in the world to live. If you factor out 638 First Nations in Canada, better them against the same set of social indices, they came out 83rd, just ahead of Mauritius, in other words, mired in third world poverty. By any objective standard, that is Canada's national shame. Those aren't my words, they're the words of former Prime Minister Paul Martin, and he's absolutely right. And that is again highlighted in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report about the cultural genocide, and it should mobilize Canadians now to implement the treaty relationship, rebuild the relationship between Aboriginal peoples in this country, and make this country work for everyone. Ironically, of course, the Indian Act took away rights from First Nations that the newcomers were embracing. The best one in the Saskatchewan context is the freedom of religion because many people came to Saskatchewan from other places where they couldn't practice their religion. Uh, once the Indian Act applied, of course, um, First Nations spirituality was, was outlawed. As I say, most Canadians would be shocked, appalled, and ashamed if they knew what their government did to the First Nations people in this country, the Indigenous people. <laughs> Fundamentally, they don't know. And the reason they don't know is this isn't taught in the classrooms of Canada. I'll just touch on a couple of things just in case you don't know, but here's one of them. The prohibition against spiritual practices. I mentioned people were imprisoned, First Nations chiefs, some of the most revered chiefs were imprisoned for trying to practice their own spirituality and traditional uh, religion. The permit system forced First Nations people to obtain consent to uh, buy or sell any agricultural produce, uh, livestock implements, and uh, unfortunately the record is very clear, much corruption, many of the profits were kept by corrupt Indian agents and farm instruction instructors. Uh, and uh, the best book on that is Lost Harvest by Sarah Carter. It's very clear. The pass system. First Nations couldn't leave the reserve without a pass to say so of the Indian agent. Senator John Tatusis created the uh, Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations by surreptitiously going from reserve to reserve and meeting with people uh, to organize. And in fact, he was arrested from time to time by the RCMP and uh, sent back to Poundmaker, but of course, he was successful. But ultimately, um, that success uh, was tried to be impeded by Indian agents who didn't want First Nations people organizing in any way. <clears throat> the right to counsel, not until 19, uh, legal counsel, not until 1951, the right to vote 1960, and has been f uh, fully acknowledged only this year, the introduction of residential schools and the abuse inherent in that system, and the intergenerational <clears throat> dysfunction that it spawned continues to affect all Canadians, most significantly, of course, Indigenous Canadians, to this very day. So the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Report makes a very clear statement, and, I, and this is one of the things I want to amplify here because I want <coughs> policymakers, leaders, and uh, government officials uh, to know that the Truth and Reconciliation Report makes a clear statement about the UN Declaration as being the way forward. So I recommend that UN Declaration now because I think there's an opportunity 
to use it as a benchmark and move forward in the Canadian uh, state. I'll sum up my comments on the benefits of the political process at the tripartite negotiations in Saskatchewan because I think uh, it had the potential to play a profound role in uncovering some of the real factors affecting the lived experiences of Indigenous people. Uh, we created this book, which is a, my final report as Treaty Commissioner, and Ian had a role in, in some of that work, as did Marilyn, um, because what we were doing is this, answering the question, how do you implement the treaties in a modern context? And this book is called Treaty Implementation, Fulfilling the Covenant, and uh, what it does is it outlines a business plan, a strategic plan to, in fact, implement the treaties in a modern context. And I think, I'm not saying that's a perfect plan, but it is a template that can be used, perhaps, in other jurisdictions as they look as to how to implement that treaty uh, relationship in the current context uh, in their jurisdictions. Uh, this process has been adopted in Manitoba, and I know Jamie's going to speak about this tomorrow through the Manitoba Treaty Relations Commission. As I know in Manitoba, they're similarly working diligently to improve the treaty relationship and the respect between First Nations people and other Canadians. Respect is fundamentally at the core, and it's that lack of respect that hinders a proper implementation uh, on a nation-to-nation -nation basis uh, of the treaty relationship. Without respect, you can't have understanding, and without understanding, you can't have harmony. In my opinion, one of the fundamental truths uncovered by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that Canada is at a crossroad. The way forward will be determined by the amount of effort we put into understanding one another and the action we're willing to take <clears throat> based on that understanding. I'll talk a little bit now about human rights. <clears throat> I've outlined the fundamental importance of the treaty rights and Aboriginal rights in our country and I want to say that both the observance of and the strength of human rights is predicated on the respect we have as a society for equality, equity and diversity. Most human rights commissions in Canada have broad mandates to promote, protect and educate the public about human rights. The commissions in Canada have the tools to resolve complaints for individuals and groups of people and all of Canada's provincial territorial commissions and the Canadian Human Rights Commission, in other words, the National Commission, belong to something called the Canadian Association of Statutory Human Rights Agencies. That group, which is called CASHRA, um, espouses the Paris Principles as adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. And I mention this uh, for an important reason. The principles outline the functions of an independent and active national human rights institution, but all of the uh, cohort institutions in, in Canada uh, follow these same basic principles. So number one, what do they do? They deal with uh, research and investigating violations of human rights laws, and they attempt to resolve them through litigation or resolution in some other form. The Human Rights Commissions give advice to governments on how to protect and promote human rights and they educate. Education is a big feature of the work of all Human Rights Commissions. Now I mentioned the adherence of the Paris Principles because it demonstrates the nexus between international human rights legislation and activity and the human work that takes place inside Canada. It's also very clear that CASHRA has positioned itself so that it's obligated to respond to Aboriginal treaty and human rights issues facing Indigenous people in our country. So there's a role for the Human Rights Commission, I think, there's another lens, there's another vector, there's another group of agencies that can help in uh, creating a much better relationship between Aboriginal people and other Canadians. As an example of the collaboration by all the agencies, the whole group, CASHRA, called for all levels of government to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in 2012. In 2013, we called for a national um, investigation into murdered and missing and harmed Aboriginal women and children, urging the government to participate in that work. And of course, we stand by that, and I know that the uh, new Prime Minister uh, is uh, intent on 
having such a national inquiry. In addition to the challenges facing Aboriginal peoples related to colonization that I've outlined, there's another important uh, concomitant story um, that has now <coughs> just been told. The story is actually the story of thousands and thousands of Indigenous people, and it's a story that's finally and explicitly been outlined in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's reports. That story is about intergenerational mistreatment of Aboriginal children and their families, and we all know <coughs> that many Aboriginal communities struggle because of this mistreatment. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report will be a stunning catalog of hurt. As I mentioned earlier, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, sometimes referred to by the uh, acronym UNDRIP, is becoming more and more important, I believe, to a resolution of these issues in the Canadian context. As evidence in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, um, the call to action, the 94 calls to action, the UN Declaration was mentioned 24 times. So I commend that document to all leaders that want to help in resolving the issue we have in Canada. It's an international document, but it's one that's very important. <clears throat> we remain convinced, said Murray Sinclair and his commissioners, we remain convinced that the UN Declaration provides the necessary principles, norms, and standards for reconciliation to flourish in a 21st century Canada. I'll just outline some of the key issues on the UN Declaration Number 1. It's an important minimum standard of the human rights of Indigenous peoples. The UN Declaration is used to interpret laws and policies by courts, tribunals, and in other legal documents. It consists of many norms that are in fact already contained in the treaties, conventions, and covenants. For instance, the honour of the Crown. It is the result of decades of negotiation about states and indigenous peoples and stands to serve as a mechanism to rectify historic wrongs committed by states. The UN Declaration is seen by many as a call to action to establish with indigenous peoples a human rights record that we can be proud of in this country. UN Secretary General said at the time that the declaration was adopted, this marks a historic moment when UN member states and indigenous peoples reconciled with their painful histories and resolved to move onwards towards uh, uh, together <clears throat> in a path of human rights, justice and development for all. So you can see the clear linkages. So in conclusion, I'm just going to make these comments. To me, it's very clear that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has identified both wide-scale and focused education as necessary to move forward. Education is a key uh, factor to move forward. Manitoba and Saskatchewan have made significant gains in making the lexicon of treaties part of the classroom pedagogy. I'm proud to say as well that the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission in partnership with educators, the Ministry of Education, and a number of officials in Saskatchewan, the School Boards Association, and the Teachers Federation, has developed a citizenship education pedagogy from K to 12 that answers the question, what does it mean to be a Canadian citizen? What are the rights of citizenship? But also, what are the responsibilities that go with those rights? And how do you build and maintain respect for every citizen? That material is now completed and it's now going to move into the school system uh, uh, as I speak. In mentioning the importance of education, if there's, uh, <clears throat> I want to say if there's one takeaway from my presentation, and that is you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, partner with those agencies that have created treaty education materials and citizenship education resources. I'm sure that uh, Jamie Wilson and uh, and George LaFond in Saskatchewan, the Treaty Commissioner now, <clears throat> would be quite willing to share those materials in every jurisdiction in Canada. They're compelling materials and are required because they do teach about the relationship that we need to have, the positive relationship they mention, 
of course, the residential school experience and what we need to do to build out of that. So I would encourage everyone here to talk to those jurisdictions uh, to, that have made some meaningful, uh, some meaningful progress and uh, had some reflectful discussions about what can happen in your jurisdiction. The last thing I'd like to say is we need to explore ways in which the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People can help every Canadian, Indigenous or otherwise, to move out of this morass that we're in and rebuild a relationship that is broken. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has identified the Declaration as a necessary and powerful tool and the Canadian Association of Human Rights Agencies has identified it as a powerful tool with which has much untapped utility. Today I began my presentation by asserting that there is a connection between Aboriginal rights, treaty rights and human rights. It's my intention to demonstrate the nexus of uh, those rights and that it can be a real resource of collaboration and cooperation and relationship building. If I've learned one thing from working in this nexus, it is that when a community struggles with severe oppression, the entire society su uh, suffers. I've seen it firsthand myself, and I've heard it from many community leaders, elders, and experts. To me, the truth is inescapable. The health and well-being of our society is directly proportional to the health and well-being of our individual communities. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has asked us all to work together to build a healthy society. Martin Luther King said in his letter from the Birmingham jail, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I say to you this afternoon, racism anywhere is a threat to harmony everywhere. And what do we need in this country? We need harmony. How do you get harmony? It's generated by respect. How is respect generated? It's generated by understanding. Understanding is generated by knowledge, and education is the foundation for building towards that respect and knowledge. Education is critical. As a president of the Canadian Association of Statutory Human Rights Agencies, I would ask you work with the tools you have in the areas of your influence to talk to the human rights commissions in your jurisdiction and see what can be done to help build a more healthy Canadian society. At the start of my presentation, I asked the question, is there hope? Hope for a better partnership, hope for a better relationship between First Nations and other Canadians. Hope that the First Nations share in the peace, prosperity, and the harmony that's the very essence of this country. And hope that the treaty relationship takes its rightful place in the Canadian state. That's a distillation of my hope. And fundamentally, the hope I speak of is right here in this room with us right now, because that hope I have is ultimately in your hands and in your hearts. Thank you very much.